So we've been hearing a lot about neuromorphic computing in this uh, workshop, and uh, there is a lot of nice examples that we've, saw, we've seen already today. And I just wanted to point out there are some differences between the original approach that, uh, as was mentioned today uh, by Srinivasan, and it was started out in the 80s with Carver and, uh, and today. So today, uh, there are several goals that are motivating the, the research and development, which is, for example, building computing systems for neuroscientists, building high-performance computing platforms for neuroscientists, or building spiking neuron chips for making money, like True North. Uh, the idea that uh, came out of the 80s with Carver and Max Delbruck and, and John Hopfield and Feynman was really to try to understand how to exploit the physics of, uh, phys of natural systems, including silicon, to reproduce the physics of neurons, of cells. It was really uh, deeply rooted in biology. In fact, Carver's first student was a biologist who had never seen a transistor before, and, and Misha, together with Carver, developed the silicon retina, the silicon neuron, and many of the things that we are actually using today to build these uh, types of systems. And in Zurich, at the Institute of Neuroinformatics, we follow this approach. We uh, listen to the silicon, like Carver used to say. And also, we follow the approach of uh, synthetic biology. This is what uh, Dick Feynman used to say, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And the type of things that we actually build are using subthreshold analog circuits because these subthreshold analog circuits reproduce the biophysics of real neurons. They, the mechanism of carrier transport in transistors is diffusion, so you have Boltzmann statistics, and you get exponentials and logarithms, just like you, you have uh, in uh, ions crossing channels, in, in proteic channels in neurons. So the type of uh, neuromorphic processors that uh, my group is building in Zurich is uh, essentially a large arrays of these uh, massively uh, parallel arrays of these analog circuits that implement neurons and synapses. They really emulate the physics of real neural systems. It's not just multiplying by some number. It's really implementing dynamical systems. Uh, there, there is a lot of parallelism because all of these circuits act in parallel. If you stimulate many of them, they just integrate currents in parallel. We, uh, we do use rates to compute, so there is the, these analog signals going across, but there is here, in this case, there is a need for spikes. Spikes are actually very useful to represent signals and to, to reduce power when you're doing this type of computation and to communicate these signals across long distances, across the chip or between chips. So it's, it's the optimal communication method that also biology found. So we have analog continuous time uh, streaming circuits for doing the computation. And then whenever neurons spike, we send these digital e events uh, long distances, either on chip, across cores, or across chips. These are uh, all of the circuits, or most of the circuits, are completely passive. If there is no data, if there is no signal, it's just leakage currents. They are extremely low power. There is no active amplifiers or anything in any of these circuits up here. And the uh, digital ones are asynchronous, they're self-clocked. There isn't a clock that's burning power continuously. So we're really talking about ultra low power, not low power like you know, tens of watts or hundreds of watts like some of the things that we've seen, really uh, picojoules, microwatts, nanowatts even, if you, if you go at the single neuron. Uh, but the price that you have to pay for this low power is that they are very imprecise, noisy, inhomogeneous, and slow. So you might think of these as bugs or features. If you're trying to reproduce the physics of real neurons, these are actually features. If you want to do you know, high precision convolutional networks, these are bugs. So this is the point of discussion of where, are the, where is this technology useful? But this is the price that we have to pay for this ultra low power. On the other hand, be, uh, because we, we can use these neurons and put them in architectures that have learning and adaptation and feedback, at the architecture level, we can have resilience. We can have fault-tolerant, mismatch-insensitive, robust type of computation. So you, you're, we're really looking at this paradigm shift that we've heard also about yesterday and this morning, where we have these circuits that are doing memory and computation in the same place. We are not using this uh, I, uh, standard way of doing computation where you transfer data back and forth between a processing unit and a memory, external memory bank. Uh, we are not trying to do the type of applications that Google is doing where you're trying to do recognition of stored data. The, really, this type of technology is optimal for streaming continuous time dynamical data that's coming in, you act on the data as it's coming, and you take a decision, you produce a motor output as, as you have the data coming in. So there is, no, there is no clock, it's continuous time. And because of that, it's really, really important to have 
time constants which are matched, well matched to the type of signals that you want to process. If you want to interact with the environment, if you want to recognize speech, recognize gestures, your dynamical circuits should have time, cost, time constants that are well matched to the type of time constants that we produce. And so we try to slow down silicon. We really go through a lot of effort to have time constants of the order of 10, 50, 100, 500 milliseconds in our circuits. Uh, so, so that they are inherently synchronized with the real world natural events that we want to process. This, has the ba uh, this is an additional advantage of uh, reducing power and, and bandwidth. So re at the system level, we also have ultra low power because of this, because we slow down silicon. And uh, we've been doing these types of, of chips since, you know, since the 80s. I was at Caltech with Carver and Christoph. I was a student of Christoph. Um, we didn't start in 2005. We started much, much earlier than that. But uh, uh, a recent chip that now has enough neurons and synapses to do something interesting is the one that I call the Reconfigurable Online Learning Spiking pro Neuromorphic Processor. Essentially, if you see what it is, it's a big uh, memory chip in which the memory elements are these uh, dynamical circuits, these synapses that can have uh, short-term plasticity, long-term plasticity, uh, different types of, of dynamics. Uh, all of these neurons are connected, to, uh, sorry, all of these synapses are connected to neurons on the side, and the chip, this particular chip has 256 of these neurons. If you look at the block diagram, it's more like you had a block of synapses that is uh, programmable with short-term plasticity, another block of synapses that has on-chip learning, they're really dynamical systems that depending on the timing of the spikes and on the statistics of the outputs, they change their weights. There is, so these could be like the uh, distal synapses that Jeff was mentioning. These could be proximal synapses. You can think of these as compartments in a multi-compartmental model. And finally, you have the, the analog circuits that implement the neurons. All of this is uh, embedded with logic. So you have mixed signal, analog and digital. It's fully reconfigurable. So you can connect any synapse to any neuron and any neuron to any other neuron. So you could have multi-layer, liquid states, recurrent, combinations of liquid states and multi-layers and so on. So it's really flexible and reconfigurable online. Um, and once the, the neurons, as I said, generate uh, action potentials, those get converted into digital address and they get sent out uh, right away asynchronously. There is no clock. So if we zoom in and we look at what's actually inside, this is just to give you an idea. A single neuron here is about 30 transistors. You have the, these subthreshold analog transistors. They represent uh, channels. You have calcium channels, sodium, potassium channels, sodium activation, sodium inactivation, positive feedback loops, leak uh, circuits. So the, you really can get a lot of interesting behaviors. In fact, if you take data from the chip, you, you'll see that you get um, behaviors that resemble real neurons. This is a three variable system. It has uh, the membrane potential variable, the calcium adapta uh, spike frequency adaptation variable, which is lower, and the reset potential. And Henry Arbelbanel tells me that if you have the three variable, you can, you can really get chaotic behavior like you can with Hodge, full Hodgkin-Huxley models. This is a, a variant of the adaptive exponential integrated and fire model. So you can, as I said, you can change the reset potential, the refractory period. You can turn on spike frequency adaptation. Depending on the parameters that you put in, you can get you know, bursting or, or different types of spiking behaviors. The synapses are the same. You have maybe five, 10 transistors and you implement really uh, the same type of synaptic dynamics that you, me that you measure in real, in real cells. This is a real measurement from a real synapse. This is data from the chip. You can change the weight, uh, where is it here? The weight of the synapse, you change the efficacy, you can change the time constants. You have a lot of parameters that allow you to play and, and get different types of behaviors. Of course, you can put many, many transistors in, in, uh, in parallel, and then you can integrate all of these currents spatially, so you can get your weighted sum of synaptic currents. If all of these elements share the same dynamics, you don't have to have a capacitor per synapse. You can do the, you know, if it's a linear filter, uh, spatial and uh, temporal superposition. So you only have one large capacitor on the side of the chip and a very high dense array of synapses in, inside your chip. And in fact, now we are replacing these transistors with memristive devices. You can even use these emerging nanotechnologies to, to have um, state-holding elements, not something that leaks away. So you, you, ha you have a capacitor, you have your synaptic currents, and you have your weight voltages here. If you add extra circuits to the weight voltage, you can have learning, on-chip learning, online, on-chip continuous learning, 
to these weights, and that's, that's what we also did. We've been uh, following the literature. There is a huge number of papers on STTP. A, a very nice set of learning algorithms was proposed by uh, Stefano Fusi and colleagues um, from Daniel Amit's group, Nicola Brunel. There is a whole uh, series of papers from the, from the computational neuroscientists, theoretical physicists, that show that you can go beyond plain STDP. And the nice thing about these uh, learning rules is that they require things that are very, very nice for VLSI. They require bistable synapses, so one bit. You don't need to have 32-bit floating point resolution. Redundancy is a requirement, but that's easy to get because we have very large scale integration. We can put many, many synapses. And uh, they are compatible. They, 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 are, they require or at least compatible with, with variability. And so we don't have to worry about minimizing mismatch. We can use small circuits and still be able to do uh, computation and learning. This is an example of what's happening if you have presynaptic spikes, postsynaptics, and your weight is changing. And this is also nice because also Jeff was saying you have internal variables that are changing the weight, but then you essentially you have two states. Either you have the synapse or you don't. So it's also some, a way of having like structural plasticity where you either have a synapse or not on very long time scales. On short time scales, you have your analog weight going up and down, but on long time scales, you have a drift that's pushing you up or down depending on where you are. And using these circuits, we, we, we show that you can do supervised learning using mean rates. So you can do basically perceptrons. Uh, we have papers that show that. You can actually, because we have spikes, we might as well take advantage of that. And if you order the timing of the spikes in a precise way, you can have one-shot learning. You can, you can learn uh, sequences of uh, phonemes. So by, uh, with this unsupervised precise spike timing mechanisms, we can actually, and we show that we can learn sp sp fine spatiotemporal structures. All of these are, as I told you, uh, inhomogeneous, variable, unprecise circuits. So if you use one single neuron to do uh, like a binary classification task, a binary perceptrons, it's going to be very weak, or I would say crappy classifier. But we have 256 neurons, and you can do ensemble learning. And uh, you can take advantage of all of the bagging and boosting theories that are there. And there you can really become competitive with the state of the art if you collect many of these perceptrons together and you, and you use your bagging techniques. And we showed that you can compete with the standard machine learning approaches. Of course, as I told you, you can implement recurrent networks. And uh, we try to do Hopfield attractor networks. There is a nice paper. Nice Example in the proceedings of IEEE paper for that. And uh, you can do uh, liquid state machines following some of the work that um, was inspired by Wolfgang's work. We show that you can do liquid state perceptrons in uh, brain machine interfaces, and you can really decode online spikes that are being measured from, from uh, brains of zebra finch, of birds in that case. So that's with the learning. But you can even do more interesting things by connecting uh, neurons. Um, either hardwiring or having learning algorithms that learn the structure of uh, soft winner-take-all networks. This is also work that's inspired mainly by Rodney Douglas and Kevin Martin in our institute, but also by Wolfgang Maas. And uh, let me show you here. This is uh, some data that actually Emre took from one of our old chips where he was applying some stimuli with maybe 190 hertz and 210 hertz on two different regions of the chip. Uh, so that would be the uh, light blue uh, input. These are just spikes over time, the address of the neuron and time. And then if you look at the output of the neuron, there is some initial dynamics, initial transient, where the, neuron, the chip responds to both inputs. But then through competition, through a population of inhibitory neurons, the, winning, the population that receives the strongest stimulus suppresses the population that receives the weakest stimulus. So it's a classical soft winner-take-all network. And we have chips that can do this in real time. There was a video that I can show you if there is time later. So we started, what you can do now is you can combine these winner-take-all networks. That's where interesting stuff happens if you combine together these sort of cortical microcolumns. And uh, one of the things that we, classical thing to do is to look at decision making. If you have different populations of winner-take-all networks that are competing, you can have them uh, do different things. And one classical experiment is you, if you present the same input to, the same to two different populations, for example, if you present an image on one retina and another image on the other with the same sort of strength, then your perception will alternate between these two inputs. And the same thing happens in, in real time with the hardware. And you get this gamma, uh, gamma band distributed switching, which is exactly what is measured also in, uh, in primates. 
Another example is if you connect, multi this is again work that was done with Emre, if you connect multiple winner-take calls together uh, through uh, another winner-take call network, you can uh, model inference, you can clamp one input and you can see what is the output uh, of, the, of the whole network. You can do queue integration, function approximation, all of these things have, can be done directly in hardware with no computer in the loop. You just apply inputs to your physical system, your substrates, your chips, and you measure the raster plots in output. Something which is uh, very nice that um, Steve mentioned this morning is the Sudoku. We, we just connected neurons together in this uh, Sudoku type of arrangement. You, you, it was explained this earlier today. So if, if you just make one neuron inhibit all of, one neuron that represents a digit, inhibit all of the neurons that represent the other digits in the cell, then you can so solve these constraint satisfaction problems. And this is uh, stuff that uh, Jonathan Binas is doing. We just, with using our neurons, we just connected them with this uh, inhibitory connections without really trying to match the precise equations that come of Gibbs sapling. We just connected them and we observed that uh, the network uh, explores the state until it finds the optimal solution and it tends to stay there more. We did not need to inject any noise. We just use the thermal noise that's present in the chip and just try to get the um, refractory period to match with the inhibitory period, and if there is any fluctuation, then you get out of this valley, like, like was shown earlier today by Mihai. This is with the thermal noise in the chip. Uh, you can even connect winner-take-all networks um, in this way, where you have, if, if one node is representing a variable A in one network, and another node is representing variable B in the other, and they excite each other, then the, this variable B will impose constraint on, uh, on the other network with variable A. And uh, this can happen if you have these networks oscillating at different frequencies. So then you can implement constraint satisfaction and traveling salesman problem and uh, three set problems using these coupled networks without requiring explicit noise. It's just the fact that they're oscillating and they're oscillating at slightly different frequencies because of mismatch that they can explore different states. All of the details are in this nature communications paper and uh, neural computation paper if you're interested or you can come talk to me later. Finally, the other thing that is really interesting that you can do is you, if you connect multiple winner-take-all circuits together, you can implement uh, soft uh, state machines. If you give me any description of a finite state machine uh, in XML or any, any other description, I can convert that into coupled winner-take-all networks. Actually, Emre can convert that into coupled winner-take-all networks. And then from that, you can really uh, program a network of spiking neurons to carry out a procedure. If I see this queue and I see this input, then take this action. So in doing that, in this PNAS paper, we show that you can actually connect these, synthesize the, this, these networks to carry out the same type of tasks that are being measured with the monkeys or non-human primates in neurophysiology labs to probe cognition. So you show a stimulus, a cue, you, you tell the monkey there is a rule, and then if this rule is satisfied, make a saccade to the left or to the right. We did exactly the same thing with our hardware chips, whatever chips were available in the lab. At that time, we needed to collect all the chips that we had in the lab and connect them together. So we realized it's important to do the, these large-scale projects where you have multiple core, you have enough neurons on a single chip so that you don't have to have all these wires hanging around. And so the next type set of slides I want to show you is how to uh, efficiently put together many uh, computational functions on a single chip. And uh, so this is cl clearly a multi-core uh, approach. When you have multiple cores, you, can con you, can, you need to s transmit signals between one core and the other. And we've seen different ways that were proposed today and yesterday. The classical one is to use a 2D mesh or a toroid structure. This gives you most, the most flexibility. You can connect any one neuron to any other neuron anywhere on the network. But it's also very expensive in terms of resources of memory. If you have a fan out of F, and if you have N neurons in your, in your system, you need F log N bits per neuron to do that. Um, it's very flexible, uh, it allows you to do anything, but in, uh, if, we, if we really wanna build cortical models, we don't need to have the total flexibility. We can just try to analyze how is cortex organized and try to take into account those constraints to try to optimize for memory resources. 
And this is an example of, some, of a neuron that was measured uh, in, uh, in the institute. Uh, it's a pyramidal cell of layer three that shows how the axon branches out and then connects to local clusters. It doesn't connect with everyone around homogeneously. You have some structure in the connectivity scheme. So we can take advantage of this and try to optimize rather than having a wasteful but powerful uh, connectivity scheme, we have a constraint but optimized connectivity scheme. And this is what we did with uh, Rajit Manohar, who's also one of the main architects of the True North chip. And we came up with a two-stage routing that first uh, does branching. So if your neuron has an axon out, it branches to n possible uh, clusters, and then it broadcasts. So we have a multicast scheme that is combining source address and, and target address uh, routing. So this two-stage routing really minimizes memory requirements. We get a square root factor there, which is really a, a big improvement. And because we did not start our design in 2005, like many of the, of the things that we saw recently, we started actually later. We could take advantage of all of the things that have been proposed in the, in the field and get, get the best features of, of all of them. So we, we designed a new chip that is uh, taking this, these advantages. It's fully asynchronous, it's event-driven, it has this two-stage routing scheme that minimizes memory requirements, multicast, hierarchical. It's using both mesh and tree routing, and it has heterogeneous memory structures. It actually uses CAM, SRAM, and capacitors, analog, to, to distribute the memory across the chip. So this is, this is an example, if you have a four-core chip, you can send any one spike from any other chip uh, around the board to any one neuron on any one of these cores using these uh, uh, combination of routing schemes. The chip that we, we, we did a prototype chip uh, using a very old technology, it's 180 nanometer. We put four cores because we wanted to have a multi-core. Of course, it's the smallest. We're, we're still trying to explore principles. We want to pay the least amount of money, so we make the smallest chips available possible. Still, this is a quite large chip. It's 40 square millimeters. Uh, each core has 256 neurons, and then there are all these uh, routing memories and uh, different me memory hierarchies embedded in with analog and digital circuits uh, in each core. Uh, it, it has uh, 1,000 neurons because f it's four cores of 256. Each neuron has programmable synapses, so there are 64 programmable, so here you have really structural plasticity that can change the connectivity scheme. And uh, each neuron can fan out to 4,000 different neurons, so it's, it can have this clustered connectivity. It's massively parallel, continuous time like the others. It's using subthreshold analog and asynchronous digital extremely low latency, and if, if we, if we with this is measured data from the chip, if we, get, if we just inject current into all the neurons, make them all fire, this is, would be the worst case scenario, uh, we get about 276 microamps on a 1.3 power, uh, power supply. So we're talking about microwatts here. Now, uh, because um, Ning is a really good designer, he designed things such that you, you only need to connect with direct wires, um, multiple chips, to scale this up. So he did a board where he put nine of these chips together, and I want to show you an example application of, uh, of this board where we only use three, actually, chips. And because convolutional networks are so popular, we thought, well, let's, even though that's not our main motivation, let's try to see if we can use this board to implement a convolutional network. This is just to remind you, convolutional network is typically composed of multiple layers. You have your input layer, your convolution layer, where you, you convolve the data with some kernel, a pooling layer, and then a classification layer. So what we did is we connected a silicon retina, a dynamic vision sensor that's developed by my office mate, Toby Delbrook, directly with wires. So events coming out of the chip here go directly into the first chip of, the, of this board. Um, with uh, subsampling so that we have 32 by 32 input pixels. Then the convolution layer was actually convolving these events uh, with uh, oriented bar, very simple oriented bar. This is just you know, a toy example that we tried. And uh, then the pooling layer was used and then we trained the chip to, to decode the output. Let me show you. What we did is we took some data that uh, Bernabe Linares Barranco produced by showing to the retina a deck of cards and flipping the cards, you know, over two seconds flipping 50 cards. So you go and you show this to the retina. If you see what, what the retina sees in a slowed down version, this is um, the suits of the deck of cards that are being presented to the retina. 
These are the output of the four convolution layers, the oriented bars, and this is the output of the pooling and then the classification output. This is slowed down, so if you actually see what's going on, within a few milliseconds when you start to show this to the retina, the neurons in the retina start to spike. Even before the image has finished, the convolution layer starts to produce an output. The pooling layer starts to produce, let's look at here. The pooling layer starts to produce an output, and then the classification layer tells you what suit it is. So by the end of the two seconds of the, uh, that in which you flip all of the cards, you can know exactly what was the sequence of suits that, uh, that you were showing to the, to the retina. Let me see if this is, would be the live demo. So here is, it's really hard to see what's going on, but you see that the chip is producing in real time these raster plots that tell you what the suit is. This is just to show you the, the very simple convolution layer, convolution network can be done without requiring any computer in the loop. Let me, let me conclude by saying that I, uh, we saw some really nice challenges that were put up by Bruce yesterday morning, and uh, I, I hope I convinced you that our chips can, are addressing this uh, power challenge really well because of our ultra-low power uh, neurons, synapse, and communication circuits. We go from picojoules per spike to microwatts at the chip level to milliwatts at the board level. Resilience is something that we are addressing because of the adaptation and on-chip learning circuits that we have. Complex memory hierarchies is something that we actually implemented. We have uh, CAM, SRAM, and analog capacitors all living in the same substrate. Um, high performance networking is something that we managed to achieve thanks also to the collaboration with Rajit Manohar at Cornell. And, uh, and so this is uh, the current state of the art that we have, but we are already thinking of the next steps. And so I'm really excited about the possibility of using the ST microelectronics uh, fully depleted uh, silicon on insulator process. It's an ultra low power process, and we are going to put this uh, type of architecture on this 28 <coughs> nanometer. It's going to be really challenged to see if these analog circuits wor work well uh, and scale on these more advanced processes. Uh, the idea, there's an EU project which will try to put, in addition to this uh, 28 nanometer, uh, advanced circuits, uh, resistive memories, and 3D technology. So we're going to try to put everything, it's a really high risk uh, project, but we're going to try to do this, hopefully three years from now I'll be able to sh show you some nice demos using this new technology. The next thing that you might think I want to do is implement deep learning systems. I don't want to do that. This is not the type of technology that's uh, useful for that. I, I don't think I would be able to compete with GPUs or Nirvana's type of systems. What I do want to do is I want to interface, like, a, like we started to do, these chips to neuromorphic sensors, silicon retinas, silicon cochleas, uh, IMU units, temperature measurement units, and build examples of cognitive agents, these robots that will go to Mars at one day. But uh, I, I'm not thinking so big as Jeff is thinking. I'm thinking of cognitive agents as any small system, these tiny brains that can do interesting things. So of course, uh, autonomous robots is one thing, but you can think of a cognitive agent also as, for example, a micro device that's living in your body that's measuring metabolites in your bloodstream and deciding on its internal state, on the context and on the sensor's output whether to release a drug or not. That would be a cognitive agent in my mind. Or if you think of Internet of Things and wireless sensor networks, the same thing. If you're measuring the traffic flow or the uh, cars in a parking lot and you're measuring some temperatures and something, you, you decide to take an action on it. So it doesn't have to be a full-blown humanoid robot. It could be really a microsystem that's uh, acting on the data that it senses continuously with ultra-low power circuits. And slowing down silicon minimizes this power consumption. I, I argue that uh, it's important to do Slow, slow scale, small scale systems to try to understand how the brain works. So all of this work actually was done in collaboration. Well, as I said, Rodney and Kevin inspired much of this at the Institute of Neuroinformatics. The students and the postdocs uh, were really, really great in getting all these chips to work. And also the collaborations with Rajit Manohar and the next student of mine who is now at Cornell, Saber Moradi, Gert Kauenberg and Emre here. Uh, Stefano Fusi and Fabio Stefanini, uh, also ex-student, well, Stefano is a professor at Columbia, Fabio is an ex-student of mine, he's there. Elisabetta Kika is a professor at Bielefeld, also an ex-student of INI. Christian Myers, an uh, ex-postdoc of mine that's now a professor at Dresden, and Temis is working on memristors at uh, Southampton. Finally, the last uh, slide is the, yeah, I'm not part of the Human Brain Project, everybody asks me that, I'm actually benefiting from the other sources of funding that Karl Heinz was showing earlier 
uh, yesterday, actually, and also from the Swiss Natural Science Foundation. And finally, the last slide, uh, when I thank you for your attention, is uh, an advertisement slide where uh, the, another workshop very similar to this one is going to take place in a few months in uh, Italy, in Capocaccia. The deadline for registration is actually March 13. Uh, many of the people in this room are actually going to be there, but I hope more and more can come because it's exactly the type of community that we are addressing in this workshop. And it's a workshop. For two weeks, we bring chips, robots, and we actually try to get these things to work together. We discuss with uh, neuroscientists about these primate experiments and then put the result of those discussions on, at work in these chips. So look at the Capocaccia website. If you just Google for Capocaccia and Neuromorphic, you'll find the link. And uh, I hope to see you there in um, end of uh, April, beginning of May. Thank you for your attention. So I think we have time for one quick question, um, or we can have discussion during the break that if we have a quick question. OK. Uh, thank you very much for some very nice examples of, uh, of uh, what you can do with spiking neural networks. My question is, are there any plans or ideas on um, how to extend this approach to larger networks, which are uh, arguably computationally more powerful? Well, the, uh, as I told you, the CX Quad uh, is a prototype chip. We just tried with the cheapest technology that we could afford and the smallest size that we could build, and it's 1,000 neurons. Now we have 9,000 neurons. Already with 9,000 neurons, we don't know what to do with them. So we are already... Uh, we don't require more to explore computational principles and try to use these chips to understand how the brain works. As soon as we will find the need, uh, for example, with this 28 nanometer process, in the same area we can put you know, many, many more neurons. So it's, uh, the size and scale is not a problem at this point. Unless you want to build an exabyte computer, but we don't want to build exabyte uh, scale computers. Right, thank you.